Um, so first of all, I would say that we, we don't have to deal with everything in this discussion. And also, I think this is, is more of a brainstorming session than like, I don't think the output of this is going to be some neat theory of exactly what we have to do. Mm, no, no. And I think action in the real world is always kind of like that. It's always a bit ad hoc. It's always a bit trial and error. Uh, it's messy. And so I think that's okay. Like we should just accept that we don't have perfect knowledge, perfect answers. Um, but if we want to do something, uh, we can think about what could we do. Uh, I guess I should also just say up front the, you know, to frame it that we, we had that discussion the other day and it, it seemed to just get stuck on the question of should we bother or is there any point, you know, or is there anything at all that we can do? And that that's not what we're going to discuss. Although we, I think we agree that, that it's difficult to have any real effect on the world and that there aren't really good grounds for optimism, right? Like, I think we both have a fairly gloomy outlook. Mm -hmm. But in spite of that, we can still talk about ways of acting into the world and we can look for uh, gray pills in the <laughs> in the sea of black, you know? Yeah, and I mean, we shouldn't forget that we are actively sorting for the hard problems. So when you have a, we have a gloomy outlook with regards to the, the, the hardest problem that there is to to solve. Um, we don't ponder like, uh, can we can we build a, a car or can we um, save lives in 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 Africa at the moment? Because we can do that. Um, but what we can't do is the big problems like survive for a billion years or um, regulate the population, or something like that. Yeah, I mean, those are the, the problems we have now are, are even those problems are, are solvable. I don't know about surviving for a billion years, but, <laughs> but regulating our population is a solvable problem in an engineering sense. It's just not uh, politically or maybe psychologically. It's more of a political or psychological problem. Yeah. The, and the main reason why they're problems has to do with human nature and the nature of our culture and its inability to recognize these things as problems or to admit that they're problems and to take this engineering approach, right? Yeah. That's really the problem, that we can't get our culture to view these problems as problems that are capable of being solved in a rational way, you know, by... You know, just understanding causes and effects. And I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm getting a little bit too abstract, but uh, the, the big problems we have are the problems that exist in the blind spots of the worldview of our culture. And to some extent, maybe even in the blind spots of our biology or our psychology, yeah. right? That, that we, we didn't evolve to regulate our own populations. We didn't evolve really to understand ourselves in an unbiased way, uh, or our societies. And so we have these big problems of dysgenics, population growth, finite resources, uh, and also a kind of uh, insanity caused by the mismatch between the human brain and the modern environment. Like, you know, mm -hmm. the, the dysfunctional sexual market is an example of that. And we even have philosophical problems, I think, that are coming into uh coming into awareness or at least kind of poking through the the curtain that usually hides them you know like questions of what are we supposed to do with our lives or what should our civilization do like what's the point of it um we we keep coming back to those issues right this is something i've noticed in all of the discussions you have about uh, like even the one we had the other day it came back to should we bother why do anything right what's the point of it all so we're kind of lacking that raison d'etre to begin with. We're kind of lacking that that sense of purpose, which might be, well, one. It's one of the big problems that we have to deal with. So anyway, th this this collection of problems, I guess we can call it the problems of modernity, and what we're going to talk about, or at least what we're going to start talking about, is 
what can we do to try and solve these problems? Like, what can we do as individuals? Yeah. Given that we you know, we don't have the power to just engineer the solutions. Like, we're not talking about the engineering side. Now we're talking about the political and psychological side. How can we get these problems into the awareness of ordinary people in some form and create the will to solve them? Exactly. That's the problem. But I don't think you can you can't tackle that head on. You can't just push, um, for example, population control um, right into the sphere of, of public discussion. You just ha you have to push at the subject from a different angle, from from where you can spot um, a wide a, a nascent widening of the Overton window. So, for example, if you think about that uh, article from the other day that we talked about, um, the Economist article uh, about um, the crisis of liberalism, I think it was called. Um, you can critique um, basic um, tenets of liberal democracy, for example. Um, uh, the, the, you can push at what is taboo in the current zeitgeist. And that's what you should do. And if you can push um, the Overton window in one direction or another, then that opens up um, gates for discussion of other subjects, such as dysgenics or something like that. That's, that's the basic strategy that I think is going to be successful. Because just um, entering one of these completely foreign subjects to the public debate. It's, um, there is no basis for discussion there because people can think that way without having been somewhat taught to do it before. Right. They need to see the problem first before they can even start thinking about it as a problem that needs a solution. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, I agree. I think you can approach this at different levels too, that there are there can be an intellectual vanguard that, that goes ahead and engages the intellectuals. Yes, and that, that, that's, that's more of an in-group discussion thing. And, and you can have other intellectuals from other um, schools of thought peek into and look at, it, at that from time to time, which is basically, I think, what happened with that uh, the crisis of liberalism article. Right, that's part of the vanguard. Yeah, exactly. But I think that's really important that because yes. those people to some extent pull along the masses so it, the question of whether you aim at the elites or if you aim at the masses is one of the questions we should and maybe the answer is both but um both but separately not at the same time right right yeah uh, and that's what i think lots of right-wing activism is especially on the internet is very very counterproductive Yes, <laughs> uh, and that's that. because <laughs> and that's because it it is more aimed at the in group than at the out group. That's a usual problem of political movements. Um, you can see that with feminist um, mm -hmm. activists that they they have a certain language in their group, which when it, it is exposed to the wider world, um, it sounds insane sometimes. Um, for yeah. example, the yeah, kill all men or whatever. It is insane, but that's the thing. And those groups tend toward insanity. So that itself is a problem of how do you create a movement that doesn't degenerate into that kind of insanity. Mm. And that's a big that's a big topic in itself. But um, to bring this down to something specific that I saw recently, have you seen that uh, documentary by Lauren Southern? The farm yeah, I saw it was up, but I, ha I haven't seen it. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think that's an example of great propaganda that is moving the Overton window. Because yeah. it, it isn't taking some kind of, you know, really oppositional stance to the worldview of most people, right? It's firmly within the ordinary worldview in the sense that it's not saying something like... Um, you know, it's not... It's not it, doesn't, it isn't ethno-nationalist. It isn't might equals right it's just look at these people and their plight look at how this thing turned out this great left-wing experiment in you know racial justice 
and now you have people getting massacred and you have uh, these people, you know, stuck in you know, camps and stuff. And they have nowhere to go and, you know, nobody seems to care. So it, it's, that's a really good example of how you open the Overton window. You, you break down the, um, the underlying assumptions, right? The assumption is white people can never be victims, right? They're always the oppressor. So you say, well, here's an example where white people are the victims, and the left. And then you watch, and then you watch the the opponent squirm and try to rationalize that in some way, and 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 then the neutral observer can can see that and and um, can make form their own opinions based on 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 how they act in response to what you show them. So yeah. Right, right, and I think also, so to some extent, you you fight this war by going within their assumptions and then bringing out the contradictions, yes. rather than attacking the assumptions directly. You accept the assumptions um, for the sake of argument, and then you show that they lead to a contradiction, and you do mm. that in this this way with this kind of propaganda. Like you don't, um, you know, you don't just say, "Well, there's a contradiction here." You say, "Okay, but what about this?" No, that's what you do in an intellectual debate, but that's not what this is about. So, yeah. 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 Of course. Because you want to make the contradiction felt, not necessarily yeah. understood consciously, but you want to create that cognitive dissonance. Yeah. Um, that's the appeal to the masses thing. But that, that I just, I watched about half of it and I thought, this is excellent propaganda. <laughs> like this, mm-hmm. this is, it is propaganda. It's not uh, like a rational argument. It doesn't have a bunch of, it has some statistics, but it's not, you know, it's not um, statistics based. It's narrative based and it has appeals to emotion, but Mm. um, that's what works. And it doesn't have to lead to a conclusion either. It just has to open up the window and say, look at this and get people to look at something, you know? So... I think we have we have people doing that kind of propaganda very well and we have people doing really really stupid things as well. <laughs> um the main focus right now I guess should be on things like stopping mass immigration. Right? That's yeah. the number one issue. That's that's the the water gushing into the Titanic basically. Mm. And what do you think is the best approach there at those two levels? Like uh, at the normie level and at the intellectual level. Well, if we're going at the normie level, I think I think there's reason to be very optimistic about this. And I didn't think that maybe a year ago. Um, all the recent developments have been in the direction that we are for, basically. Um, now, I mean, just today uh, there was the Supreme Court decision, which I. I, I'm not. I haven't. I'm, I haven't read up on that extensively, but it's it's a positive development there. Uh, I don't know how uh, how sure if that was a sure thing before or not. I have no clue. But and then there was the the election in Italy with a PM there. He's he's basically right down on our side, um, and that's huge because well, you can agitate and. Um, argue for your 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 view viewpoint and get the current politicians to maybe get somewhere in your direction because they fear a public backlash um but they will never be all there with you because they have their worldview set and that's that and that's why i think maybe lots of people are very black pill about it because they see that these politicians they they always cheat uh, when they think that the public is not looking, even if they uh, like mind the words, say say what what they think people want to hear. Yeah, um, the they do something else. In, yeah, yeah, uh, 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 and well, that's true. But what's going to happen if you can change the the view of the public is that the next generation of leaders they're going to, to a larger extent, want what the public wants. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I see a reason for a bit of optimism, actually. Yeah, well, I think the electoral politics thing is a bit, it's a mixed bag, because on the one hand, like if you look at Europe, the 
the votes still come down pretty left wing in most of Europe. And even in Italy, I think that was more of a fluke, right? That they got in the way they did. Wasn't that yeah. kind of, I mean, it, it wasn't a complete fluke, but it was a bit of a lucky, co- like there was, there were a few coincidences involved in them getting into power the way they did. But it, it does seem like the mood is shifting, but at the same time, the conditions on the ground, uh, you know, new voters being imported and born all the time means that... Um, there is a bit of a time It's a bit of a race, yeah, yeah. It's a bit yeah. of a race yeah. against, yeah. will the effects be felt? Because most people only react to the effects when they feel them. They don't react to the you know, predictable consequences of something. They only react yeah. when they actually feel the effects. Unfortunately, so that means it's very hard to get people to to do something proactively through the mechanism of politics. And yeah, the question is, will the effects be felt fast enough before it's too late? I, I think the other black pill, I am I'm not no I'm not supposed to be dispensing black pills here, but the other one is the age structure of the population. Yeah. So yeah, we are in a bit of a race against time here because Absolutely. The younger population would have to really be overwhelmingly going in one direction to have like to actually tilt things through electoral politics. So we might be looking at at a different like a different option which is given the reality on the ground, how do we try and prevent the ship from sinking even though it's now no no longer cohesive or it's low IQ or both. That mm. might be a bit of a challenge, right? Yeah, but I mean that's that's the facts on the ground. You just have to accept that that's what it is. That won't change. I mean, no matter what we do, really. So you have to right. start from that point. But I mean, the, see the, what can you do? The thing forward. is, do you appeal to Muslims? Do you appeal to those guys as well and say, mm. "Look, this ship is you're in it now." So, I mean, I think you want a broad appeal. I think some of the very nationalistic approaches they they don't work very well with most whites because they've really been brainwashed into thinking that's evil and they alienate everybody who isn't white or isn't a native right mm. so i think pull I mean, I mean they get certain people very agitated they get some people really really on board but they also alienate a lot of people and so i was thinking maybe a different tactic would make more sense well- to some extent, you can always appeal to self-interest because, I mean, by yeah. by representing the ones who are in the jurisdiction where you are, um, you don't want they don't want their voice, their power diluted. So why why bring in more people? Yeah, I'm not saying you pander to them, but I think the very extreme versions of this, like where you're extremely nativist are not very effective no no they can never have a have a large enough base that's just the facts i think yeah Yeah. and and at least that that seems to be the case in the united states i don't know there might be some european countries where that's not true but maybe in eastern europe yeah yeah i mean you have based hungary (laughs) kind of holding the (laughs) line which is it's kind of funny because hungary is sort of saving europe and then they're getting bashed for doing it but I mean, uh, if you look at w- what's happening with the crisis in the EU now and Merkel's crisis, the Eastern European countries are actually winning at the moment. Yeah. So that's another white pill. <laughs> I'm going to be the white pill dispenser once again. That's another white pill. <laughs> no, it, that's true. There are some really positive developments. Yeah, and it does seem to be the periphery is where the the good ideas are coming from and the center is just the decadent uh well i guess that's where the establishment is so that's why you don't get that much change in the center mm. yeah i mean in this case the centers of power in europe france germany and the uk um in sweden you think the tide is turning a bit right like yes i mean the polls in sweden are many of them are putting uh, the swedish democrats on top uh, that's the largest party and I mean, the, um, it's a proportional system and all of that. So uh, it does. It's not as huge as it would be in uh, in a first past the post system, but um, it's 
still an earthquake like change in public opinion. Mm. So uh, they have doubled three elections in, in a row, I think. Oh, the size of the of their um their representation, their voter base. Their voter yeah. base? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So at the moment they have thirteen percent in parliament. Okay. And they're poll they're polling at something like twenty five now and possibly mm. higher in some in some in some polls. Um, and the social democrats are plummeting. Yeah. Which is a trend in Europe. I don't know if you have followed it, but it's called I think it's called Pasokification. That's from the Greek uh, Pasok, the Greek um, social democrats, so, uh, we, which were eliminated almost completely uh, during the Greece crisis. Oh, the Greek in, crisis, okay. In 2010, I think, 2011. Um, and um, that has spread. I, the last, I think, was in, uh, in the Netherlands, where the Social Democrats, I think, got 6% of the vote. And in Sweden, in Sweden, the Social Democrats, people maybe don't know this, but they have been a 40% party for the majority of the last century. Um, they've had 40% of the vote, so they've basically yeah. owned the coalition, right? They've... Yeah, yeah, and okay. uh, even at some point they've had uh, their own majority, hmm. and that's in votes, in pure votes, over fifty percent. Yeah, uh, but that was a long time ago. But um, what was I about to say? Yeah, they, they, and they're polling at like uh, low twenties now, twenty-two, something like that. Hmm. Yeah, things are changing, and and the that's the thing. There's a bit of a void. So into any. Um, like in any period of chaos, that's the time to act, right? That's the time to push something in one direction or another. And so that's why the far right and the far left are kind of rising up because they sense that this is the moment where they could uh, gain some ground. Um, mm. I, I don't know what conditions are like in Sweden or in Europe in general on the ground. My guess is that they're not that bad for most people, right? There really isn't a big problem now. It's more of the dread of the future that is driving this change, right? Uh, yeah, that's basically it, yes. Yeah, so then the the main thing to focus on is not something like even criminality, but just what is the future going to be like? Well, I mean, crime gets emotions yeah. uh, up. So, I mean, especially crimes against women, of course. Right, right. So, I mean, there's always a place for that in all movements, no matter if you're left or right wing. Yeah, so the crying child at the border or the crying, uh, the dead baby on the street, both yeah. of them work. Yeah. Well, what was your question again? <laughs> oh, well, I was thinking that, I was wondering if, um, if we're kind of seeing the end of, of economics as the main, like the center of political discussion, like yes. as the main issue, and the switching yes. to other things. And that's why these central, this kind of centrist uh, technocratic parties are failing. Like the, it seems like all they can talk about is economics, and mm. then some of these humanist, um, you know, values. But they don't seem to have any sense of pragmatism about anything other than economics. No, and they and they have their lifestyle, the the big city lifestyle, and I think their biggest problem is not their ideology. It is that they don't have enough um, insight into how people think mm -hmm. who don't live in the big cities, I think. Well, I think they're also insulated from the truth by their ideology. Like they, they just seem to believe that everything is going to turn out great. Yeah. You know, or at least reasonably well, you know, we must do this. Like Merkel's whole thing about just letting in a million people that that just seemed to me like insanity i still can't really f fathom the it. thing about it was it was basically about her not wanting to have a border patrol because that would look bad so that i mean you can read about this really that her, her basic her basic thing was that a german border patrol it would look awful because you know of the historic they would look like a bunch of Nazis. <laughs> yes, exactly. And that really? was, I think that was the thing that, that really prevented her from taking the, because she is the ultimate pragmatist in all other issues. Mm. Yeah, that's what I thought. She's like a centrist on everything and she has no real yes. 
No, she has no ideology at all. The only thing she has is, I don't know, power. She want to be in power. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And so she made this disastrous choice because she thought the optics would be bad and worse than the consequences. That's basically what I think. She she underestimated the consequences because, you yeah. know, um, there wasn't that many people at that point who thought the consequences would be that big because mm -hmm. they had never been that big up to that point. I mean, there was the argument about... Uh, um, at least here, about the, the refugees that we took from the Balkan crisis. And that was, right. I mean, we, we could manage that. That wasn't that bad. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 there were some problems. There were some problems from it. But, but you, I mean... You got angry foreigner out of it. <laughs> <laughs> but this is far worse. And you got um, Schelchim. Yeah. So it <laughs> wasn't, wasn't all bad. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I think... One of the angles the, that is effective, one kind of propaganda that's effective, is just pointing out the truth in very basic terms, like just ba simple graphs. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I know people don't like statistics. They like narratives. Narratives are important. But I also think some of those like hate facts, just really basic ones, are incredibly compelling. And when people learn those things, and they also learn that They've never been told them. They've never been taught them. Like Pinker admitted this the other day, right? That when when the far right is telling people things that are true that they've never been told before, that are like really important and actually really simple, then people start to really question everything they've been told, right? Because why did nobody mention that half the murders in the United States are committed by blacks, right? Like why did nobody mention that? The problem with that is, I, I agree with that, that that's a useful, has been very useful. But to make the next leap, I don't think that's going to be as useful because the people who are amenable to, to, to that approach with statistics, they're already there. They're already in, well, most of them at least. I'm not so sure. I don't think we should assume that... Um, that, that we've exhausted the pool of people who can be persuaded with some of those things. Because in real Maybe life, not. I still meet people who have no clue about any of those things, right? Like to us, that's old stuff from years mm. ago. But there are a lot of people out there who just don't know basic facts about the world, you know, like the population projections for sub-Saharan Africa. Like that's a great graph, right? That one's really compelling. Mm. Um, or the, you know, Nigeria's population is bigger than Russia's. I like to bring that up all the time because people are always floored by that, that, that comparison. Because they think of African countries as sort of insignificant, irrelevant. And then you say, well, Nigeria's got more people than Russia. And they're like, wow, okay, now maybe that is something we should, you know, <laughs> think about. Like, there are a lot of people down there, right? We can't just feed them all. We can't absorb them all. Um, so I think there is a place for that kind of thing still. And I, I think, um, that's something that we can do. Like just, you know, people like, like you and, and me, we can, um, put together some of those basic statistics or just propagate them. Mm. You know, we can like work on that. Like, I think a lot has been, what well, you were talking about that in-group signaling, right? And one of the problems with that is, is you put out something that's aimed at normies and then you get a bunch of idiots on your side, uh, you know, making fun of you for, for it, or, you know, kind yeah. of signaling against you because, you know, either because it's a normie statistic or because, uh, you know, they don't care, right? Like you, like I, I use this graph of, uh, how the population of Africa has grown since colonialism, right? That it's exploded to point out that whites didn't oppress blacks. It's actually that whites saved hundreds of millions of blacks from dying, you know, um, in the totality of it, right? I mean, in specific cases, there might be things you'd call oppression, but the overall effect has been en enormously beneficial. And when I do that, I almost always get some alt-right guy saying, well, that's, that's a bad thing, you know? <laughs> and I just want to smack him because it's like, shut the fuck up, you know? You might think that, but, um, I mean, I personally don't see it as a bad thing, but even if I did, it would not be good propaganda to say something like that, right? That's counterproductive. The goal should be, hey, look, European civilization isn't 
uh, the worst thing ever. It's actually the best thing ever. It's worth saving. Mm. You know, we have to, that's an actually really important thing is we have to make the point that European civilization is good, that civilization is good, right? These very simple points, you can think of them as moral or just, you know, basic value judgments about, you know, that, that most people would agree with. Like, hey, isn't it cool that uh, most children live to adulthood now? <laughs> Why is that? Oh, European civilization. Uh, so we, we've got to reverse this thing that everybody has been taught that non-Western societies are morally superior and somehow a better way of life and everything about them is wonderful and they were living in peace and harmony before we came along and destroyed them. We have mm. to destroy that narrative because that's really that's a really important one to destroy um, because that's really the moral basis for a lot of these uh, a lot of these leftist you know racial justice claims like the people of the South have a, a right to live in Europe because Europe took all their stuff, you know, mm. stole their ideas out of their heads and <laughs> kept them down and oppressed them. So we have to reverse it's, that. View. It's a hard, it's a hard thing to push through that shell because there is some kind of reflexive, like I don't know, Lutheranism or whatever it is in in, in people here. Um, mm. That me very bad. Wait, and, what? Uh, the, that you're supposed to denigrate yourself. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Uh, yeah. I, I think that's a very Northern European thing. But why didn't that operate in the like 19th century or early 20th century? I think it did, but on the religious level. It has moved to the political level now because religion has receded. Well, we can shift it back. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah we probably to. we could, yeah. Right? We Get could, the left just hating themselves as individuals. That would be great. <laughs> Maybe we can give them a way to do that, you know. Actually, that's another thing that's really important is attacking on the grounds of hypocrisy, taking it back to the individual level, saying, hey, look, you're just dumping your virtue signaling, your claim to virtue on society. Live up to it yourself. That shuts up a lot of people. I mean, I see that all the time. That's a really effective uh, way of attacking people who are making those virtue signaling claims like, like, mm. I'm good because I believe that our society should do this. And then you just say, well, what are you personally doing? Take the locks off your doors, bring people into your house, give up all your money. And as soon as you start saying that, they, you know, well, they block you or they shut you up. Uh, but they also shut up themselves. You know, they get enough of that and they start shutting up. The problem with that is that when they, so you can do that when they do that on Twitter or I think that was probably what what you were talking about, but it's yeah. not really feasible to do that in a real social setting. You well, can you can a little bit. I mean, you can you, yeah, you can make a joke a out more, of it, you in know, a, in a much more polite way, maybe. But um, you're basically the asshole if you po if you point out someone's hypocrisy in a social setting. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying, but I think. Online activism is probably the best way to do these things anyway, because mm. like it's much easier to open the Overton window if you can go around the taboos on certain topics. And, and that then trickles back into everyday life, because once people have those taboos being violated online and people spend a lot of time online these days, then in real life, all of a sudden they, they just know it's not really a taboo. It's sort of been exposed. You know, and the left has sort of done this with things like sexuality, like gayness or or BDSM became like now an acceptable uh, basis for making little jokes in public or making jokes on TV shows. Like something like BDSM would have been really taboo in the 80s or 90s. Like it mm. was sort of shocking in, say, Pulp Fiction when they had the gimp come out of the box kind of thing, all that stuff. Um. I don't know if you saw that movie. I did, but it was a very long time ago. Well, that was like remember. that. That movie was kind of shocking to people's sensibilities, mm. even in, yeah. in the nineties, were were a pretty open-minded time. But now I've seen in like just ordinary TV shows little jokes about BDSM and gay sex and all this stuff mm. that were taboo sure. back in the eighties and nineties. So. It, it, you can push those things through 
other channels first, and then they trickle back into everyday life, and then people. Start... So the the, the, the thing, things about the bell curve and, and Charles Murray and, and that whole discussion, um, that wouldn't have hap- that would have pushed into the more mainstream and garnered like the podcast with, with Sam Harris and articles on Vox and everything. Uh, that wouldn't have happened. But for like internet discussion, YouTube community, and all of that. So, yeah, exactly. I mean, right. The Vanguard puts if the Vanguard puts out ideas that are really challenging. Um, sometimes the and, and the keepers of the of the culture, right? The guardians of of virtue, you know, the self appointed guardians of virtue, will uh, often be tempted to attack those things, and then that brings them into into awareness and then it eventually works in their favor mm, if they're yeah. presented in a reasonable way and you know if they're presented well not if they're presented in a stupid way you know like if you make yourself into a caricature that's the the you know the satan of your time like if you like you know well Spencer they may they may, they may they may shine some light on you in order to show what a ri- ridiculous figure you are and right without yeah. without saying anything further that 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 happen sometime. Right. So yeah. you get people who court disfavor on purpose to get the attention and that often yep. that has a negative effect because that helps to shut the Overton window. But if it's done right, you know, if you if you trigger them at just the right level, like in a way that they become very triggered, but the average person when they see the opposing side says, "Well, that's actually not that unreasonable. That's not that scary." That's really effective, right? If you you just have to be very careful um, to aim at that level that triggers the you know the establishment, but doesn't trigger the ordinary person. And I think Trump did a lot of that, right? Like he yep. was very effective at triggering the establishment, the media establishment, so that they would then go out and say, "Oh my God, what a horrible monster Trump is!" Yeah, and and then so he, he, yeah, he was he was like uh, offending the sensibilities of. Of uh, the elites, the, the, the upper middle class, the elites, uh, yeah. while speaking uh, plain spoken things that yeah. would would go in any in any bar in the country or whatever. Yeah, I don't think Trump is a savior, but I think he shows how to play that game. Yeah, I don't know. I've often thought that he went a little bit too far. You know, like he does offend sensibilities at a at a level that I would think is not really wise. But you know, so far, he's made it work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> I don't. Know. He's a bit of a wild card. Trump is like uh, he's just a random, like the mule. Have you ever read the Foundation series by Isaac Asimov? Oh no, I haven't. Oh, okay, well that's actually kind of an interesting series because it talks about um, a collapsing galactic empire, and um, the this guy predicts that the empire is going to collapse, and everybody sort of laughs at him, but he is this great academic and so uh kind of to placate him they allow him to create this thing called the foundation which is a little group of people who live way off in the periphery of the galaxy who are supposed to prepare for the collapse and you know kind of save the knowledge of civilization for the future Mm. it's an interesting story because it it kind of relates to our time It, it it's about a collapsing empire, a collapsing way of life, and how uh, I think it was based on the collapse of the Roman Empire to some extent, but I don't know. Maybe it's it's I don't know. It's a, it mixes up a few different things, like Roman Empire, and then also the the foundation is a little bit like the United States in a way. So you might have been thinking about the collapsing European power structure in the United States replacing it as the dominant power, but. Um, Anyway, in that series, there's this character that comes along who is a mutant who has special powers, and he kind of screws up the whole plan, and he's called the Mule. And so, I, I don't know, it's a, it's not a great reference if I have to explain it that much. But, uh, yeah, Trump is just a wild card. Like, he, he isn't like anyone else, and you can't really predict what he's going to do. And, I mean, you can't rely on him to do anything. But at the same at the same time, it seems like it is almost impossible to think of a, um, a president with his um, who pushed the policies that he did and wasn't like him. Uh, well, yeah. Are there any historical examples of people who really changed history? Like, 
Hitler is an example. The equivalent would be if Jeff Sessions became president, I think. And that's unthinkable. He would never get the votes to do it. But I, yeah, I don't think Jeff Sessions is... A, I mean, he wouldn't have the charisma or the... I don't know. Trump is just sort of a chaotic force. He's like a force for chaos. He's sort of chaotic, from our perspective, sort of chaotic good. Like he's kind of on our mm. side, but he's also this force for chaos. Mm. And I guess chaos is sort of on our side right now. Um, a little bit of chaos is good right now because the worst case scenario is like a calm, orderly death. You know, <laughs> like so he represents a bit of a flailing around. But I don't know. But I mean, I don't think Trump has any answers. Like I don't think he could. I don't think he has any solutions to our problems. He is just using this um, this moment in history to take power, I think. And he is advancing certain causes that we might agree with. But Yeah, but I think that's basically the best you can hope for in a politician. Um, I, I don't know. You, you can't hope for a, a real politician with a wide base. Who... Well, isn't Italy a better example right now of a i don't know i don't know enough about it to, to say but yeah maybe he has a bit of a um more of a of an insight into what the situation actually is that guy whatever his name is but uh the pm um i, I don't know enough about it to say anything more about it hmm. anyway i guess there are other things that we could talk about that are a little bit different uh, that would make a good topic for other talks like what can people as individuals do to uh kind of hedge their bets you know like prepare for like living in a declining civilization or being a prepper or something yeah although i don't think just being a prepper at this point i mean i guess that's another thing we could talk about which is what is the likely trajectory in the long run where is this going like what what is the most likely course of of history um, because if, you know, if things are going to take a hundred years to collapse, then you're not going to be able to do much to prepare for it now. No. Oh. Right. But then on the other hand, there's a little bit more time to try and stop it. If you're thinking of a very rapid decline. And so, I don't know, I, I don't think we should get off on that tangent, but I'm, but really quickly, what is your view on that? What do you think the timeline is like? Uh. I'm going to be very boring. I think it's just going to be a muddling through a kind of slow decline in that way. If we are keep going on the course that we're on. I don't think, I mean, the only case where it will be sudden is when you reach, if you reach carrying capacity and you get starvation and that kind of thing. Mm. Um, and that's unlikely to happen on a global level at the same, at the very same time. So, well, but there but, could be a local crisis, like a domino thing where one part of the world starts collapsing and then other parts of the world, like there could be a loss of global confidence if, yeah. if dominoes start to fall in certain but, parts of the world. That, that, that's going to, that's probably going to be more like a financial crisis type of situation in, in the West, for example, because I mean, where the likely thing where it would happen would be in, in Asia or in Africa. Mm. Maybe you think there's gonna uh, be an, an, an in Asia? You mean like a well, inner Asia uh, uh, or like the west part, western parts of Asia? Uh, not 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 China. Yeah, not, not China, China, not East Asia. Well, so okay, I'm gonna give you questions on about timelines here. So let's talk about uh, something that is so significant we could call it collapse. What's the probability of that happening in 50 years and uh, 100 years? And maybe also 25 years. So 25 years, 50 years, 100 years. What do you uh, think? Yeah, you'll have to define collapse then first. Well, let's say, um, well, we could define it as um, die-off. I mean, we could define it as a significant... Um, so a starvation of up to some percentage. Or, yeah, it could be war, starvation, anything like, mm -hmm. let's say... A massive die-off of, say, 5%. Yeah, 5% or higher, that would be one way to mm -hmm. define it. And then we can also talk about the probability of a major um, global depression or financial collapse. 
Mm. So what are, given those two things, and looking out 25 years, 50 years, 100 years, what do you think are the probabilities of those things? Um, I guess well, the financial so, collapse, might you might even compress that a little more, like five years, 10 years, because... Yeah. Um, I mean, the financial collapse thing, um, where you can look at that historically, we have had two big cl- financial collapses in the last century. So the probability of that happening within the next hundred years is, I mean, it's almost yeah. certain. Yeah, yeah. So, so in that sense. But I mean, the 08 collapse, um, maybe I'm being a bit insensitive, but that wasn't that bad. No, it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't a real economic collapse. It was just um, a global and, recession and a kind of... And where, where we live, at least, it wasn't really all that awful. But, I mean, the Great Depression was awful. Yeah. That was basically almost at starvation levels in parts of the U.S. Well, let's take that one as the baseline, like something on the scale of the Great Depression. Okay, in in a Western country, basically, in in the Western world. Yeah, I think it would affect the world as a whole, but something that has an impact that's roughly comparable to the Great Depression. Well, um, I don't think it's 100% um, how to calibrate this. Um, I'm putting you on the spot. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, maybe maybe a 20% chance of something that bad in, 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 in the West in the coming 100 years. Oh, really? In the 100 years? I would say it's almost certain in 100 years. I mean, I don't think, think? we can get through okay. 100 years without something. I don't think we can get through 100 years without a major die-off. I, unless... I'm thinking basically a hobo with sticks with a, you know, with a sack hanging off it going between, between houses. That's the scenario I'm thinking about. Right, right. No, I know. I think, but in 100 years, I think that's almost something worse than that is almost certain. In the West? Yeah, I think globally unless we have a really major course correction. Hmm. But I mean, in 25 years, I'd say, well, I'd say about 50%. I think actually um, 25 years is long enough for this thing to collapse. I see, I see now why, why you're not fond of stocks then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I don't think that I have enough control over it. I mean, that that actually would be an interesting question of how do you um, invest for the future uh, if you have the black pill outlook, like black pill investing, that might be a good mm. topic. But um, you don't think that there's a significant chance of a major financial disaster? Well, I think uh, what I said, what I said, I think that's significant, 20%. I think that's a, a but you're talking in a hundred years though. That's a long time. I mean, yeah, but I I was thinking about, I mean, I wasn't thinking about an 08 crisis. I was thinking about the 29 crisis. So that that's a bit right, different. Right, but I mean, unless there's major course correction in a hundred years, the the globe will have, well, at least have twice the number of people, and um, it'll have four billion sub-Saharan Africans and. I don't know. It, it like a hundred years is. It's a it's a it's a long time. I give you that. It, yeah, I mean, exponential growth hits limits, absolutely re- reasonably fast. And if you look at the rates of growth that we have right now, there's no way those things are going to go on for even. Um, I, I share. I, I you know I share your humanness about um, the population growth and all that, but I think we also have to have some humility for the. I mean, look at the Ehrlich when he made his predictions in. In the 70s. Yeah, yeah, no, I know, but it, one bad prediction doesn't. I, of course, I, I mean, things happen in agriculture which he could have never guessed, of course, and and the safe bet to 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 take on that happening again is that it's something with that big of a uh, positive effect on, on agriculture is is no it's not going to happen yeah. well, i think also Ehrlich was coming in at the time right after the introduction of the birth control pill and mm. he didn't see the decline in fertility and a lot like a lot of these predictions depend on demographics and you know of course yeah. whether there will be a significant decline in fertility in africa and other parts of the world mm. or whether it will bounce back as i would predict but uh yeah it's very difficult to make these kinds of predictions obviously because 
there are a lot of things going on. <clears throat> and you have to account for, I mean, if, if, if those predictions um, are high enough exposure, they affect what actually happens in the world. Right, right. There, there are loops and, and yeah. many different feedback loops in operation, yeah. and ideally, so, and yeah, Ehrlich's so predictions. I mean, if, if our worries, if our worries go absolutely mainstream, that will make our prediction or your prediction in this case probably worse off. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, then the hope, the hope in making the prediction is that it doesn't come true, obviously, but. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, that's why I qualified it without without a major course correction. So yeah. I guess the, the real point, though, is how much time do we have to save civilization? Hmm. Like how much time do we have? What is the window of time in which it is possible to act into history to prevent civilizational collapse? Well, I mean, I think maybe 20 years. 20 years. OK. And well, I just. That was just, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know, but maybe 20 years. And I think just closing off mass immigration is going to do lots of good things. Yes. I, I mean, that, that's basically almost going to solve it. Because if, if Nigeria or whichever country, big countries in Africa are, are growing the fastest, can't just uh, emit... Their, their, their population in the world, well, then then the situation is unsustainable for them. They, they can't grow. Mm, well, yeah, I mean, I think that is the number one thing, is to save the West. I mean, that is the most urgent thing. Mm. But it does require a, a change in the moral beliefs of ordinary but I'm, people. I'm, I'm kind of start, I, I'm going to be positive again. I'm kind okay. of starting to, <laughs> to, to lean towards that actually happening okay that we are going to put a stop to it and um why i am so positive about that is that i just think that the equilibrium has changed in mm. in, in the whole debate so well <laughs> I, I just think that, that we will never go back to there, w there will be people screaming about it of course uh, but it's moving away from them they're they're on the losing side hmm. with regards to that argument. You know. So you think that basically we're at the tipping point and things are starting to tip in the right direction, at least in that on that issue. That's my general feeling. Yeah, uh, and I didn't think that half a year ago or a year ago. So hmm. I've changed my mind. Well, that's great. <laughs> I hope you're right. The optimistic Swede. That's a. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. I don't know if I have anything more on that, but I, I have actually changed my mind. And I think that, and I mean, I'm open to further incoming evidence. Mm -hmm. If the, the debate suddenly starts shifting around towards the other, I mean, it could happen. But I think it's a kind of like a pendulum swing, and now it's swinging towards the other side again. Well, I hope you're right, and the, the momentum is building up. Of course, that will still leave us in a kind of chaotic state. Um, as far as the worldview goes. What's worrying me with that is not um, what, what's, what's happening in the West, what's going to happen at the borders of the West, um, but that, that is what's happening when journalists start picking up stories about uh, famine, whatever, in Africa. And what are we going to do at that point? 30, 40 years out at that point, yeah. what are we going to do? That, that's what I think is going to be the major issue. And we have to prepare for that kind of thing. I mean, we have to prepare for, um, you know, we have to offer a solution to the problems of the third world that isn't export your population and isn't die, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we have to give them a third option, which is control your reproduction. Yep. Uh, and we have to make that a mainstream view. That's our challenge, I guess, for the next... 20 or so years is to shift the culture to uh, something that is a little more pragmatic and realistic about human nature. And, I, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to have to say, I moderating that view. that doesn't mean that I think the West is going to be just hunky dory after that. I just think that the, the, the thing about the borders. Yeah. 
is going in a positive direction, not like internal culture. That's a whole other kind of world. Yeah, we have a lot of problems there. I mean, like the sort of breakdown of, of sexual relationships and low fertility yeah, and, 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 and tribal groups, different tribal groups and all of that. So yeah, that, that's yeah. another issue completely. Yeah. All right. Well, we were coming up on an hour or so. We, we haven't solved everything, but... I guess we can end on almost, a fairly... Almost everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've, you've solved it all with the giant white pill. <laughs> I mean, I'm a pretty gloomy guy, but... I, 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 I think that I am too. I'm, I'm usually the gloomy kind of person in, uh, yeah. when, when politics get discussed in person. But uh, I have met so many black pill people now online that I'm, I'm, I'm a, a huge contrast to that, I think. Mm. Your contrarian instincts are kicking in now because you're surrounded by black pillars. Yeah, I, maybe, yeah. I think um, the thing, just to end this, the thing that I've I've really noticed that it is kind of depressing, but it's also partly a selection bias, is the level of apathy. Mm. Um, that the, the realism seems to just plunge people into depression and apathy and like pointing out some of these problems, um, even if you point out that there are solutions to them, it just seems to make people apathetic. Like I, that was one of the things that kind of shocked me is seeing how apathetic everyone is and how there's very little will to to exist. Like there's not much of a will to live. Um, well, <laughs> well, it just isn't very pragmatic because it's sort of it's um, self fulfilling prophecy, right? I mean, things can be very gloomy but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to make but them i mean better. even if your political um uh, if your politics ha you have a very gloomy outlook on that i mean you have you have to have other parts of your life where you're doing whatever that's not connected to that yeah yeah i feel that's mainly it i think a lot of people don't have a personal raison d'etre they don't have a yeah. personal reason to exist you know, and I think that that's maybe a topic for another discussion, but that's something else we need to to give people. The The current culture does not give people a way of life or a reason to live that is compelling to human beings. And the left yeah. is sort of filling that void with virtue signaling, but it's getting increasingly hollow. And well, virtue signaling and fapping, right? It's like, hey, more creative <laughs> ways of fapping. You know, that's basically the left. It's 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 hedonism and altruism, right? It's like virtue signal and fap and you can combine those at the gay pride parade and now it's like <laughs> an entire month of gay pride parades you know but yeah we can i think we can offer an alternative to that that is compelling so yeah i guess that's a good yep. reason for hope all right man well it was good talking to you and um yeah we'll uh we'll, we'll pick this up at some point in the future Oh, yeah. Good talking to you. And you, you have to go out and water that garden now, I think. Mm, well, we had rain. <laughs> we had some rain. So okay, the garden yeah. is okay now. But uh, I have to go pick a thousand peas. That's my little chore for today. Anyway, yeah. So uh, we'll, we'll look forward to more white pills from Sweden in the future. <laughs> okay, great talking to you. Bye. Bye.